Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter 12. Y'all okay this morning? Romans chapter, I have made a horrible mistake. Seth, will you get my glasses out of my office, please? Just grab a pair. It doesn't even matter which one at this point. Huh? Run, man. I can't see up here. Now I understand. Listen, let me tell y'all a story while, while we're waiting. My wife, whom I love dearly, wears her glasses at night all the time. And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's, it's a running joke between us. But when we were early, early on in our marriage, we, uh, <laughs> she woke up. It was like 5 or 6 in the morning. The sun was out, but she woke up. And uh, yeah, we were new. We were, we were fresh and married. We've only been married a few years. And the next thing I know, she's hitting me on the back screaming, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. And what had happened was she had rolled over and grabbed her glasses and put them on, and it was sunglasses. <laughs> Never even thought to take the glasses off. Oh, that's so much better. Romans 12. That's better than my last week joke, isn't it? That's better than, you know, she got on to me for last week's joke. <laughs> Romans 12 and 2. This has been our foundational scripture. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Say mind, that's your soul, that you may prove, say prove. Who proves that? You. That you may prove. So that you may prove what is good and what is acceptable and what is the perfect will of the Lord. Now, the Phillips translation, let's see if I've got it right here. Philip's translation says it this way. Philip's translation says, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice, which means you have to work this thing, that the plan of God for you is good and meets all His demands and moves you toward the goals of maturity, which is a very nice way to say forgiveness has rewritten your past. See, what I'm trying to really get you to do is to understand that, that in, in dealing with the belief system, dealing with your BS, dealing with the way you believe, we're not just trying to get you over into a mode of believing. Not trying to get you to, to believe like I believe or this church believes or this person on TV believes. We're trying to get you to the place where you honestly have a much easier time believing whatever the Lord says to you because what it is that's holding you back is now beginning to move out of the way. Does that make sense? Because you can have all the spiritual experiences in the world and, and you can run in, in all the, the circles and, and be in some of the places like we are where people lay hands on you and prophesy to you and say so it the Lord and that's great. But all of those spiritual experiences does not equal a renewed mind. It doesn't change what's going on the inside of you. Anytime somebody says to you, hey, this is what the Lord told me to tell you, that is for you to do battle with. That is for, that is to, for you, let me just say that. Prophecy and the spiritual gifts are not meant to build you. They're meant to remind you of what the Lord's already said to you. You shouldn't have to have somebody prophesy to you 13 times for you to believe you're saved. You should just accept that He's good. Amen? So that's all that's for is to get you to a place where you understand God's thinking like you're thinking, you're thinking like God's thinking, and you're moving forward and stuff. Now here's what I want you to get. And this is really the crux of this entire series. And, and I'm going to do my best to make a couple points and then we're going home. Because I understand when the Lord tells me this is all I want you to do. And for me to go past that is now Alan and we don't want Alan today, right? That's offensive. Anyway, <laughs> see that's Alan right there. Now, if I can get you to a place, and I'm just the starting point, but if you can get to a place personally, where your response to pressure in life is what he says. When, when, when the world tells you, well, you can't have children. And, and, and you come back with the word that says, uh, you know, blessed is the man whose quiver is full. When your response is the word, here's why it's important. There's two reasons. First of all, there's power in the word. Secondly, you can't lie if you're saying what he said. No matter what your background is. You cannot be telling an untruth if you're simply believing what he said. Now we can, we can take this Bible and sit down and two of us can sit down 
and look at it from two different perspectives. I could have a new covenant perspective. David could have an old covenant perspective. We could read the, the same scripture and I could see it as finished and he could see it as works. So now we're trying to get your mind renewed to the fact that you, you now accept Jesus. And because you accept Jesus, now you're not being squeezed into an Old Testament mold. You're understanding that the Old Testament was not done away with, however it was completed. Amen, Pastor. That's a good word. Because you don't have to go back and kill goats and bullocks. I mean, listen, if, if, if I show up at your house and you call me, Pastor, my teenager's just gone nuts. And which is most of us. I mean, we all have teenagers just have those moments. And, and I, I show up at your house, you need me to come pray or whatever. And I show up and you got a goat in the backyard fixing to slice it up. we got a problem. Because that's not how we do things anymore. But yet people want to live that way. People want to go, hey, you know, an eye for an eye. People want to live over in, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But somehow you keep putting yourself in there. See, we live in such a way that we want to live the way we think. And we don't want God to infect what we think. But we want his blessing. You can live saved and never touch the inheritance that he has for you. You can go to heaven and never have heaven on earth. That can happen. However, you can believe his promises are true and accept what the word says about you and put that into to play into your life and say, this is what the Lord says about Alan. This is what the Lord says about whatever, wherever you're at. This is what the Lord says about it. And because he says it, that's enough. I believe it. I'm going with it. And no matter what goes on around you, your present circumstances do not decide what you believe. If you're in the spirit. Now the Bible says in Romans 8. We're not going to go through all that. But the Bible in Romans 8 talks about sonship. And it talks about the only thing. Matter of fact let's just go there. Romans 8 and 14. I'm already, I'm already over here. So we may be here extra 10 minutes. Romans 8. Go back a few scriptures. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Now, before we go any further with this, I want you to understand about Romans, especially this chapter. This is called the grown-up chapter in the book of Alan. Because this is where it deals with, are you just going to be a Christian that lives by every wind and wave of doctrine, or are you going to make up your mind you're his son? This is, this is what challenges you right here. Romans 8 and 14. I'm going to tie these in my face. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of what? Bondage. Again, to what? Fear. Stop. Everything that you believe is either faith-based or fear-based. Every single thing in your life. You could take it back to a point where something changed. Everything in my Christian walk goes back to the moment that I met Jesus in Adamsville Church of God cussing out Perry Stone in front of 500 people and the Holy Spirit moved on me so strong that I didn't come to my human senses until the building was empty. However, I was completely different. Everything in me comes from that point. I believe God can do something. If He could do it to me, praise the Lord, He can do it to anybody. And the truth is, my entire faith walk comes back to that moment because it it was not a moment of fear. It started a moment of faith where things changed. I didn't even know what I was believing for, but I was dumb enough to say, God, if you can do it, knock yourself out. And he knocked me out. But I got up different. Completely different. People tell me all the time, you know, well, you know, how did that happen for you? I, I have no words. I just know I believed. And so when I read the word and I read something from the, from the aspect of, if you, being a good father, give your sons good gift, if they ask for bread, you don't give them a serpent or a stone, it's easy for me to see him as good. So it's easy for me because I had that experience of faith to believe when he tells me, I'm going to put you in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing but death and you're going to have to pioneer and pioneer and pioneer, but I've put you there to build life. I'm willing to do it. Because why would he put me here if he didn't love me and if he didn't love what was going to happen here? Right? There's no fear in that. I have no fear that the building's going to be foreclosed on. I have no fear that people won't show up. There are times there's only two of y'all. <laughs> hey, I've preached on Wednesday nights to just her. So, I mean, I get it. But you don't get over in fear. Your belief system keeps you in faith because that is your primary experience or my primary experience. Now, this is why, 
And I, I'm not rambling, I got a point. This is why I have an issue, a personal issue. You don't take it as your issue and don't get offended at me for having that issue. We're going to be Christians, praise the Lord. I don't like these judgment houses at churches. I don't. I can't stand them. I personally can't stand them because here's why. If your first experience with Jesus is based on fear, everything that you do with Jesus will be, if I don't do it, this will happen. And your quietness I'll take as a big amen. Because if it's fear-based, it cannot have the blessing in it. Is this making any sense to you this morning? Because when you live life so focused on, I have a really big devil, you have a really small God. But yet God, if he can, and let me just tell you all this. Everybody, everybody can talk about God. But it's only people who really know who they are in Christ have no problem with talking about Jesus. Because you'll see rock stars and rappers and football players get on the stage to accept the award and they'll give God big props. And their life don't bear it out. But yet you see somebody bold enough to, to, to wear a, a I Love Jesus t-shirt and the NFL make them turn it inside out. That's somebody who knows who he is. You see, you have to understand who and what. You, you, you cannot put yourself contrary to his word. You cannot put yourself in, well, I'm believing God for this and I want all God's results, but the way I live my life every day is contrary to His Word. And because I'm contrary to His Word, you know, it, you know it's grace. Well, he's just going to bless me because of grace. Let me tell you something about grace. Grace covers you while you're dealing with whatever you're struggling with. It does not empower you to continue in sin. Grace was never designed to keep you in the old life. Grace was given for us to understand a new belief system and get to a place where we can overcome because He is in us and the, the Creator of the universe is in us. But we don't talk like He talks so we can't create a good universe around us. So what we have to do is we have to really see this for what it is. Now, let's continue on in Romans 8. Verse 17. And if children then heirs... And heirs of God. Now, I, I normally do this a lot at Canaan Land, but I want y'all to see this. Now, y'all follow me on this. And if heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. Heirs of who? God. So come on, talk to me. Heirs of? God. Joint heirs with? Christ. Heirs of? God. Joint heirs with? Christ. Which means he was the prototype of how we're to live. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you something, and this really bothers people when I say it, but it's the truth. Jesus was not sent to be head and shoulders above us. Jesus was sent to show us how this flesh could live if it, if it allowed God to be full. Jesus came to show us how to live. That's why he says, greater things shall you do. Here's why greater things will happen. Greater things will happen because he's gone to the Father. He's now interceding for us. And because now I have the same God in me just like Jesus had. And you have the same God in you. We can now connect in agreement which Jesus didn't have. Come on. Jesus didn't have the agreement. The Bible says that Jesus... Listen to me. The Bible says that when Jesus was brought out of the... Oh, Lord, I'm not even on my notes, but we're okay. When Jesus was brought out of the cave, when he was brought out of the grave, I should say, he was brought out by the arm of God. However, when Satan was defeated, Satan was defeated by the finger of God. Which means when he came out, he came out under a stronger grace and anointing that he had before he passed away and then said these words... All power, come on y'all, all power has been given to me and I do what? I give it to you. But yet we're afraid that if we slip up and we don't walk right and spit white, God's going to strike us dead. Do y'all think for one minute that Jesus didn't deal with a bad attitude? Y'all know those four vacations a year he had to take? That's to get away from ignorant church folk. It's the truth. Read it. He said, how long do I have to put up with y'all? Because they had walked with him for three years and seen all this stuff. But they were wrestling over who was going to be at the right hand, who was going to have power. Missing the fact. 
My God in heaven. It's like, it's like talking about death while standing right next to the river of life. It's, it's putting yourself in a situation to where you're contrary to what he said. The doctor, let's, let's just put it this way. You, you, have, you have a knot come up on you somewhere. And you've done beat yourself up. Oh, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in three weeks. I'm going to die. And then you go to the doctor and the doctor says, no, we, we take care of that. It's fine. We did the biopsy. Everything is good. And then you say, no way, I'm going to die. We laugh, but that's what we do to God. Well, Lord, I, you know, I just can't do that. Who told you his arm was waxed short? Who told you he could do it? He said to Adam, who t- listen, y'all got to understand something about Adam. He was giving Adam an opportunity to start speaking like him again in the garden. When he said, who told you you were naked? And instead of repenting, Adam started blaming out. Not because he bit the apple but because he kept the nature. He kept the nature of saying, uh, uh, saying fear. He kept the nature of being contrary. Now go, go to, go to uh, the book of James. Go to James chapter 3. This is where I wanted to get last week. And this, if this is all I get into you today, we win. Okay? James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And then we're going to... Y'all learning anything? Y'all sure? <laughs> That's faith. <laughs> James chapter 3. Verse 2 says this. James 3 verse 2. For in many things we offend all. Well, that's, that's uplifting, isn't it? If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. And then it talks about this in verse 3. We put bits in horse's mouth. That's basically talking about meekness. Now jump down. Why is that important? Why is it important to understand that to give you context of bridling things? When you jump down to verse 14, it says this. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Wisdom descendeth not from above, uh, this wisdom, it's talking about earthly wisdom, sins not from above, but is earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. Now, verse 16 is a text that we've all used in some point or fashion in our life. If you've ever been in a prayer meeting or, or anything like this or something you're trying to counsel, we said this. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Now, I want to deal with something right here. Because what's often missed in this text is the fact that, yes, this is dealing with in your marriage or in your home. But that is the secondary application of what this scripture actually means. Yeah, you shouldn't be at home fighting with your spouse or or, or knocking your kids around or in an argument all the time. And if you wake up every day mad at the world, you need to fix some stuff. But the truth is, this scripture is saying this. For where there is envying and strife... now. Now, in the Greek, it says this. For where there is envying and strife against His Word. There is confusion in every evil work. So if God says to you in prayer, you're you're spending time in prayer, and God says, you know, I really want to use you to bring that co-worker to Jesus. And you say, I can't do that. You're in strife against the word. Which opens up a door for confusion in every evil work. How does it work? When you put yourself against what the word says, you've now decided that your way of thinking is higher than his way of thinking. And you've opened up the world, uh, the, the world of sensual and earthly way of thinking. Now, here's, here's the deal. If God says, I don't want you in debt. But the credit card commercial during the Super Bowl just got your attention. Think about this now. I want y'all to see, I believe that the enemy has lost his power. But he can talk. We dealt with that last week. He is stripped of everything but his tongue. And he gets you to do anything and everything against what the word says. Listen, you look at it somebody. When you've run into many ministry circles as I have... And, and a certain denomination tells you you're not their material and they run you off and people talk about you, you get a little upset about some stuff. 
And, and I'll never forget, I'll, and this is, I'll just use me as an example because I don't want to offend anybody in here or tell your stories. My story is this. Uh, the Church of God told me I was not Church of God material. Said it to my face. You're not Church of God material. Which, looking back, probably not. But ran me out. Left foot of fellowship. Boom, you're gone. Which is fine. They had some other reasons. We won't go into that. But that started a chain of events where people would say things, especially ministers that I had great respect for, would say things that really, I mean, hurt and wounded me bad. And when we came in here, the Lord told me to bless them. The Bible says to bless those that persecute you and despitefully use you. That's what the Bible says. The Lord said, bless them. When we, when we stepped out of ministry, we were given a seed, we were given an offering. We stepped out to start our, step out of our youth ministry into starting this church. We were given a, a check. We didn't ask for it, they gave it to us. Some things happened. The Lord said, you turn around, you write that exact amount and send it to this person. You remember, you remember this happening? I said, I want to bless them. God, I think you're crazy. This is my money. He said, oh, it is. It's your money. And immediately began to remind me of all the times that he's taking care of my family when I went through that back injury and couldn't work for three years and all the, all the things that happened in my life where we had zero income but yet we still paid all the bills. I still don't know how we did it, but he's good. And that's when I started to learn this scripture. See, I put myself immediately against what the word said. And because of my mind began to say, I don't think so. See, what was happening is I was putting my money where my mouth was and I was forgiving them, and I didn't even realize what was happening in my heart. I was letting it all go because now, see, when I sowed the seed that he told me to sow, it doesn't matter if it's money or not. When I sowed the seed he told me to sow, I'm sowing the blessing of God. Do you realize that you are anointed to sow the blessing, not the curse? Let me, let me just say it this way. We're in a bingo hall. It's a church now, but it was a bingo hall. Everybody remember the bingo halls? Uh, if, if you've been here in, a few years ago, you rode down through here, looked like Little Nevada. Man, it was just bingo halls everywhere. Y'all remember that? The churches would band together, and they tried to get us in on this, but we were in the city limits, and they, we didn't have a church in the county, so it didn't, they didn't want us involved. But they tried in the beginning, and they would come together, and I'm talking about three or 400 people at the CHS building, talking about, we curse them in the name of Jesus, and all this kind of stuff. And that sounds scriptural, and that's, oh, that sounds wonderful, and it's churchy, but it ain't what the Bible said. So when one, uh, and I, won't, I won't speak his name because he's a politician now, but he called and he said, why aren't you in on this? I said, it's, it's not biblical. What do you mean it ain't biblical? God didn't give me a tongue to curse. Only to bless. He said, you speak the blessing of God on him and see if the blessing of God won't work this Brother Allen, that's just not how it works. My response was, you've been preaching twice as long as I am. Are you ignorant? Have you not ever read the Bible? Now, I was younger then and dumb. I said things wrongly. The truth still remains. This never tells me to curse anybody. It gives me the authority to bind and loose, but never to curse. And if you can get that, you won't live in this world where God's mad at me, then He's not. And He's mad at me, then He's not. He's not mad at you. Come on, y'all. He's not. Don't put yourselves in situations where he has to come get you, but he's not mad at you. And you have to understand, for where there's envying, I want you to, I want you to put this in your head, for where there's envying against the word, or strife against the word, you open up confusion and every evil work. Because now what you've done is you've said, I'm my own God. And Satan says, I can now talk. See, we might not shout today, but your heads are going to be like, Shh. because you got to walk out of here knowing you're undefeated if you stay in His blood. You're only defeated if you get over in you. See, I, I got to finish this series and I got one more message, but if I don't get this into you, nothing else matters. Because what we learned was this. We learned that all these different things that you, somewhere in your life something taught you to believe this way. We also learned that most of the times the things that taught you to believe this way wasn't God. Amen. 
We also learn that when you come and give your life to Jesus, now you're connected with God through your spirit, but your soul is still in charge. We talked about the fact that your soul doesn't know how to interpret life. It just goes through what's going on in your mind. So your body is exhausted by having a fight that's with nobody there. Now, does, is this starting to make sense? Why do you have the fight with nobody there? Because the Bible says you're the head and not the tail, but somewhere in there you believe you're less than you are and you're trying to fix things. So what you've done is you put yourself in a situation to where now you're thinking your way through this thing and God's trying to get you quit, just quit thinking about it and start praying about it. Are y'all getting this? Because if you get to a point where your mind is just stayed on Him, the Bible says you have perfect peace, yet you wake up every day and say, oh man, this is going to be hell today. Doesn't have to be. Perfect peace whose mind has stayed upon Him. Well, you know, I just don't ever have any money. Don't have to. Listen, I've been broke. I've been embarrassed in church because I didn't have an offering. That's a true story. I've been pulled up in front of people and been told because I didn't have this. I wasn't believing God properly. I've been there. But that didn't mean that I was poor. I was rich in something they didn't understand. I was standing on something. I might not see it showing up yet, but I'm not backing down off of it. You're standing in something I wouldn't back down off of. April can confirm this. We drove by this spot for eight years. Eight years. Every time I cross that bridge, the Lord's telling me right here. April said, I don't know about that. First, first few years, she thought I was nuts. It's true. Then she started seeing, okay, he's serious. She started getting him connected. And then the day that we drove down here, bingo, the bingo machine's all in here. None of this was here. We walked in the door. And what'd he say? It's yours. That's what he said. Here's the cooler thing. Because we stayed on the proper BS, on the right belief system, the bingo hall, bingo hall guy who said they would never sell to a church wouldn't take the key back and said, I don't know what it is about y'all, but it's yours. Make me an offer. Why? Is that because we're special? Y'all, you're looking at a man who was preaching and jerked a kid through a Taco Bell window because he's been a smart aleck. So I'm not perfect. Now this was a long time ago. Let's just take that down. God's done a lot in me. But it's not because I was perfect. It's because I believed. It's not about how perfect you are. Should you strive to walk in perfection? That's impossible. But you can strive to walk in the perfected love of Christ. You'll never be perfect, but you can be perfected. How do you become perfected? Stop having imperfect reactions. Now I'm preaching to choir now. But the thing is this. All he needs from you is faith. That's it. That's it. There are things in your heart that God has spoken. And, and I know the Lord told me this. So if you would just begin to stand.